at Tacoma Art Museum, we acknowledge that we live, learn, and love on ancestral lands of the Coast Salish people of the Northwest Coast. Our museum is specifically located on the homeland of the Puyallup Tribe of Indians who have endured great hardship and sacrifice so that our communities can thrive. Today we are here with Ryan Federson, a member of the Confederated Tribes of the Colville Reservation from the Okanagan and Arrow Lake bands and of mixed European descent. She is undoubtedly an important artist working in the Northwest and it has been my privilege to work with her. Tam opened The Naturalist and the Trickster, an exhibition that paired the work of the historical printmaker John James Audubon with the contemporary installation artist Ryan Federson. I thought it was a provocative pairing because both artists worked in different styles with different histories and values, and yet when paired together, it exemplified their individual strengths and revealed a few similarities. Can you tell us about these coyote bone crayons and what they mean to the project and how you made them? Yes, so um, one of the ways that I develop content is by pairing action and uh, symbolism to create a metaphor. And so um, the coyote's bones are a metaphor for creativity and for continuous creation. And so while coyote is immortal, one of the ways that he becomes immortal through us is by us continuing to create stories. And so that's kind of the impetus for these contemporary interpretations of coyote as a character, but also the vehicle of coloring, because the audience then brings the piece to life with the method of, of uh, coyote's immortality. Because the structure of the rules work is that coyote was gifted immortality as long as any scrap of fur, bone, or whisker remained that his brother the fox, or sometimes cousin the fox, could jump over his remains five times and then coyote would be brought back to life. And so the symbolism of that is embedded into the crayons. These are cast from real coyote bones and I created a silicone molds and then melted down um, large batches of crayons and formed them in the molds and then hand finished the um, edges of the crayons. At the beginning of the mural, there is an image of a nuclear power plant that really gets me thinking about industry and energy consumption. Can you tell me more about this image and how it may specifically resonate with people in the Pacific Northwest? Yes, so this image is a depiction of Hanford, um, which is a ongoing catastrophe to our land um, and all the people in life who share that space and share the uh, contamination. And so in a traditional coyote uh, full story, it begins with coyotes uh, Coyote is, is, begins dead and is resurrected, and then it ends in his uh, demise again, and that's how you know you've got all the parts. Um, and so in this image, um, Coyote has been missing for a while, and Fox discovers his remains um, hanging out by outside of Hanford. And I feel like this resonates with people specifically in the Pacific Northwest um, and to myself is because we've, we've all been exposed to this. And including it was um, inspired after a, a conversation about a family member who um, had participated in a study about the long-term um, effects of, of Hanford um, and thinking about the generations of people who have been exposed um, and who will have, have uh, effects down the line. So Mole is Coyote's wife and they don't always get along. They actually fight quite a lot. And so what we see is kind of Coyote having been gone for quite a while. He's coming back, he's come home. Uh, Mole is quite upset with him and they argue. And then uh, she 
tries to run off and Coyote chases her and you see Mole keeps tunneling and tunneling and Coyote keeps chasing and chasing and then eventually they disrupt the integrity of the ground and it collapses into a sinkhole. Um, this piece is uh, inspired by fracking and specifically this idea that you could do something over and over and over again and know exactly what you're doing and then claim that the effect is unrelated. And so there's always like these mysterious uh, sinkholes um, that are not being tied directly to fracking. And so thinking about coyote as a way to talk about um, our actions in kind of imaginative ways. Uh, we have coyotes chase of mole as being the fracking disrupting the integrity of the of the earth and then we see the uh, effects of that when we have these these sinkholes. So here in the mural we see a new character enter the story and it looks like Coyote and Mouse are hanging out in a sweat lodge. Can you tell us more about that? So I describe Coyote and Mouse as uh, frenemies. Um, and in this case, Coyote wants to, uh, to he's you know, just gotten to, into a big fight with his wife and he's been gone a while and he wants to relax and purify with a sweat lodge. Um, but he's upset everyone he's close to right now and so he needs, he needs uh, help. And so he bribes Mouse to continuously bring hot rocks in exchange for cheese. And so the mouse brings the rock, it takes the piece of cheese and continues. Uh, Coyote, um, he gets hot, he decides he's done, he takes off. But this system that he set up um, in order to do something he wanted without having to do the work himself, it continues. And so Mouse keeps bringing hot rocks as long as there's cheese. And eventually, uh, it, it heats up the entire earth. And we see Coyote um, deciding to go back to the city because he's also a part-time uh, urban coyote. Um, and on his way back, he sees a newscast about temperatures continuing to rise and scientists are baffled by persistent global warming, but he doesn't relate it to his own actions or participation in a system that he helped develop. Within the coyote story as a whole, there's a variety of mini stories that look at different issues. And in this case, uh, coyote is demonstrating some of our bad behavior by showing his addiction to technology. Everywhere he goes, from on the bus, to on the toilet, to late at night in bed, uh, he's on his devices. And so part of there's the transition from him coming back to the city and then showing him engaged in these different um, activities. Um, this section is both a demonstration of some of our bad habits, bringing the phone to the bathroom, um, but it's also a joke because one of Coyote's powers is he has three sisters um, who are turds who live in his stomach who he can bring out and ask for advice. Um, and so this is uh, Coyote calling his sisters for advice. Um, and then we see because he's spending so much time on these devices and maybe because Mouse is resetting back the clocks, uh, he ends up falling asleep at the job and getting fired. And then because he is so into technology and into the internet, uh, he decides that he's going to find new work um, by working with a, uh, the Russians on a like farm to uh, spread uh, propaganda. And then he ends up, and I guess this is wishful thinking now, he ends up getting busted for collusion and the FBI comes after him. Um, but luckily he put that chain up so he has time to escape before they can get him. And then he goes on the run and you see that he's uh, escaping the, uh, the FBI. I like how someone added him laughing, like, ha ha. Um, but unfortunately, he decides to camp out at Bears Ears, and his campsite ends up being demolished uh, to put in oil rigs. 
which brings us back to uh, the end of the cycle where uh, Coyote awaits his resurrection to start a new adventure. One of the most powerful attributes of your work is how you invite the community to participate in the creation of the artwork. Can you tell us a little bit about why that's important to your process? Yeah, so I came to art from a little bit of a different direction. A lot of artists have the story of like being born with a pencil in hand, but it wasn't something that I was drawn to when I was very young, but I was drawn to being a part of uh, dialogue and I wanted to participate in the way we think about um, our relationship to the world. And as I started getting interested in art as a uh, young teenager, uh, I discovered that while I was working on a project, I learned so much about how I felt about that subject and began to understand in a much uh, deeper way uh, content. And I wanted to share that with the audience as well. And so I decided to format projects where there was this invitation for you to also have this creative investment and the time spent with the piece contemplating it. Um, I read somewhere that the average person spends eight seconds looking at a painting. And that's not a very long time to communicate with someone. Um, I have had people spend hours with some of these pieces, or even 10 minutes is exponentially longer than, than eight seconds. Um, but I also think about the way that we get information and the way that we understand things. And sometimes that's through completing something and discovering it for yourself, um, rather than being, being directly told. And interactivity is a way to um, encourage that kind of personal introspection. I'm intrigued about your use of coyote in your work. Can you um, explain your connection with coyote and why you chose to bring him into your artwork? Well, there's a couple different reasons. Um, the inspiration point for this piece was reading uh, Morning Dove's introduction to coyote stories. And she talked about uh, coyote being immortal. Um, the, the coyote was often going to get into trouble and so there was this gift of immortality so coyote could continue to do his work, which one of his jobs was to destroy the monsters in the world to make it safe for people. Um, and I thought, I thought about that and I thought um, about all the ways that coyote could still explain and help us understand our world and particularly as coyote is a figure of kind of mischief, the trickster, the imitator. He's often showing us what not to do, but that's very valuable because we're not perfect people and we do need an example that changes and grows and shows us how to be better. And looking at the mural after it was open for six weeks here at the museum and Visitors were able to contribute their own coloring to the mural. Are there any favorite moments of the mural for you now? Yes, this is a, a very beautiful rendition of the mural. I've always enjoyed seeing how um, the coloring activities in different communities often end up very different. And um, I really enjoy these areas where there's like lots of density and um, when the, the playful coloration of uh, the coyotes and foxes is particularly um, beautiful. Um, I am also uh, inclined to towards some of the additions. Um, I like how as you look, walk through, you sometimes find surprises. I think that they add some kind of interesting character and commentary. And so we have the climate report where she's like leaking green from her eyes and mouth. Just, I think is a kind of a fun addition, as well as the patterns on the bathroom floor um, are very subtle but beautiful addition. And then today I discovered this little weird woman uh, hanging out in the bushes with her her red balloon and I gotta say that one that one gave me a chuckle uh, I think that's uh, like my, my favorite addition to this piece in 2019 you were selected for an artist residency at the Museum of Glass in Tacoma 
where you made a collection of glass baskets that we have on display in the exhibition. Can you tell us more about your residency and the glass baskets that you created? Yes, so I was invited to participate in a residency as part of uh, Preston Singletary's exhibition, Raven in the Box of Daylight. Um, and they were inviting a series of, of native, native artists uh, throughout the span of that exhibition to uh, make work. Uh, a few years prior, I had uh, learned uh, weaving from my uncle and I had pr participated in, a, in another residency at the Burke Museum where I was able to look at historic basket forms and think about uh, the construction for twining to, to, bu to build my, my basketry sills. Um, and when developing the project for the MOG, uh, I was thinking about these beautiful forms and all these, the, the photographs I had of the historic pieces um, and wanted to incorporate them into the concept for the piece. And so I'm specifically thinking about burden baskets and burden baskets as a form, as a way to kind of layer content and messaging. So I'm thinking about uh, the, things, the things that we must carry, must carry with us. Um, and so in a lot of these, it's looking at uh, histories. And so these pieces are both depicting uh, the mass slaughter of the bison, which was conducted by the US government military and settlers in order to uh, destroy food and resources to bring the railroads and um, white settler expansion through. Um, but it's also tying to contemporary construction by looking at the crane and thinking about how our current systems of uh, gentrification, development, inequity are a, a continuation of the same systems. Coyote Restored in Starlight depicts Fox coming across Coyote's bones and leaping over and then you see the bones kind of like the, the magic of the lightning and the bones kind of spiral up and brings Coyote back and then at the, the end of the cycle around the basket you see Coyote, um, the ghost of Coyote kind of walking away. Mm -hmm.